how does that framework change how we worship, how we serve, how we suffer? We don't think of suffering in a very redemptive way in America. We think of it as something that's pretty much bad and needs to be avoided. Don't we? Yeah. Um, what about... So what about, what about third article framework? What about a conventional, traditional Christian framework? What do you do with suffering? My sense is that it's an occasion to purify yourself and, and, and improve, but more than anything, it's something to endure. It's just something to pray for strength to, to, to hold on through. And to seek comfort in the gospel. I think the apostolic framework tells us that what we do with suffering is well, strangely enough, we rejoice in our sufferings. That's what Paul says in Romans 5. Because of God's grace in Jesus Christ, suffering doesn't bring despair, although it tempts us to despair. Suffering yields endurance, and endurance doesn't just wait out the clock, but it produces character. It changes us and refines us and improves us, and that is this leaning into the resurrection that as we endure, we become more like the risen Jesus. And so we actually gain assurance in our sufferings. They're not countersigns of the kingdom, That's just revolutionary. I mean, I'm tempted to say that's just crazy. It's certainly not the American picture where we try to avoid it or, or, or work around it. And it's not just stoicism where we bear with it while we wait for our reward in heaven. It's much richer. I'm going to say it's other-directed hope. And remember, last week I, I made a stark contrast between our culture's ways of conceiving love, which are pretty self-directed, attraction, versus other-directed love. Here I think we have the same, same picture. Self-directed hopes and aspirations and goals, and there's a lot in our culture about, well, what are your goals? Set your goals, and then find ways of meeting your goals. Those are self-directed. Romans 5 is not self-directed. Romans 5 is other-directed. Christ died for the ungodly. We have received reconciliation. So we rejoice. Our hope is absolutely not in ourselves. It is in God. And it is specifically the hope of Israel for resurrection and new creation. So if, if, if suffering produces hope and if it actually brings joy, maybe not in the moment, but in the long view, then Paul can look at his churches and call believers, call his churches his hope. It's like Jesus produces not just a future hope and, and a future resurrection, but by bringing us character and hope and joy now, we become other people's hope. That's how Paul refers to his church. You are my hope. Great. Hebrews treats this whole parade of witnesses, and we'll cover them next week. Right? They are the, uh, the, the cloud of witnesses. By faith, they did all these things. But you'll miss, the, you'll miss the texture of it if you don't hear the very beginning of that. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So without hope, faith doesn't have anything to grab onto. This is really important. Faith isn't just faith in itself. Faith is trust, and trust has to have reasons. You might say our hope is the reason for our faith. And that will, that will produce a whole different attitude among Christians. Not just who are suffering ordinary sufferings, but suffering persecution suffering punishment for being faithful. Jesus is alive having, in, having risen through persecution. 
what are our usual strivings? What are the ways that I spend my energy week in and week out have to do with the hope of Israel? Are we looking at distractions? Is the way I spend my, my, my time a distraction from eternity? It can be, right? We had a chapel speaker, uh, Kirsten Moore, who gave a talk in 2010 that I just loved. And she said, your lowest point will be when you achieve your dreams and they don't deliver what they promised. Your lowest point will be when you achieve your dreams and they don't deliver. So are our usual strivings week to week, are they distractions that disappoint us? They can be. Galatians 5 says they'll produce the works of the flesh. Frustration is what comes after hope, right? After hope has been unmet. Or are they the natural drives of old creation? Family, prosperity, power, autonomy. Developmental psychologists will all say this is normal stuff for human beings. In which case, they're good, but they only belong to the present order that's fading away. They don't belong to the new order that's coming. That's a possibility. That's how hope works in Proverbs, if you look at passages about hope in Proverbs. Or are they necessary efforts? Are they things that we need and what we want and ask for is God's blessing on them? I think Psalm 130 goes in that direction. And there's a lot of our spirituality that's like that. Bless our family. Bless our efforts, right? Bless our home. Or are they, do, are they things that we try to hold together that are an incoherent package? You know, I want my good life now. I want my eternal life later. I'm still going to try to have it all. And I'm not going to want to hear that I can't have it all. The American folk Christian package is like trying to have it all. That's one way of working this out. 1 Timothy 6.17 guards against something like this when he says, as for the rich in this world, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God, who richly furnishes us with everything to enjoy. All right, they are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous. Thus, laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life which is life indeed. Are they parallel realms? Is eternity like a parallel world and our temporal life occasionally opens up to it like the chariots of fire scene when an ordinary battle turns out to be just not the real thing but eternity is the real thing in which case they don't necessarily have much to do with each other or um, and here's where I like, the, like, I like this answer the best. Are they signs of the kingdom? Remember again, remember again Jesus' healings. Remember the feeding miracles. Remember the ways that Jesus brings family members alive again and restores them to their family. Or where he brings reconciliation to relationships. Those in the Gospels are signs of the kingdom of God. They are signs of the bigger reality of new creation that's on its way. Our ordinary strivings can never replace what's to come. But what's to come perfects and redeems and remakes those ordinary things. Which means they don't have to be competitors. We can make them competitors, but they don't have to be. They don't have to be distractions. We can make them distractions. But Jesus doesn't treat them as distractions, right? When there's a blind man, he doesn't say, oh, you know what, you see spiritually, so who cares about your physical sight? That's not his attitude. They don't have to be distractions. 